Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Lots to share with you. Though there was a happy ending, the details of the abduction and abuse of three women in Cleveland has been receiving wide coverage. What does this case and others like it tell us about our society? And what can be done to keep children safe from abuse and exploitation? Attorney and child advocate Elizabeth Yore joins us with her thoughts. An international adoption has been in the news ever since Russia banned all U.S. adoptions of Russian children late last year. Other countries are also making it difficult for potential parents in the U.S. to adopt their children. Radio talk show host and mother of three children adopted from abroad, Laura Ingram is here to talk about the painstaking process and her efforts to get foreign children caught in the system to loving homes. We'll also discuss the latest round of Benghazi hearings in the U.S. House of Representatives and a few cultural stories. And by popular demand, an encore of my interview with our unseen hero, Jeffrey Wright, an amazing man. As always, I want you to be part of the program. The number, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980. Or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. Now, here's the brief news from the world over this week. Three people were killed and another 60 seriously wounded when a bomb exploded at a Catholic church in Tanzania on Sunday. Both the local bishop and Tanzania's papal nuncio were present for what was to be the dedication of a new parish in the northern part of the country. Neither of the archbishops were injured. Eyewitnesses said a bomb was thrown from a motorcycle into a crowd of faithful inside the church's courtyard just as the dedication began. Authorities have arrested eight suspects, including three from the United Arab Emirates. The bombing appears to be the latest salvo in an escalation of sectarian violence there. Last month, a mob of Christians attempted to burn down a mosque after a priest was murdered by Islamists. And one of the church's leading cardinals this week denounced the push for so-called anti-blasphemy laws. Cardinal Angelo Scola of Milan, speaking at a conference, said, Real religious freedom requires the elimination of all forms of state-imposed restrictions on religious faith, specifically citing criminal punishment for blasphemy. The Cardinal's comments came on the heels of days of violence in Bangladesh. An estimated 200,000 Islamic demonstrators there are calling for criminal blasphemy laws. They clashed with security forces. As many as 37 have been reported killed. Cardinal Scola called for a healthy secularism that allows for all religious expression, and he further warned of the West's inherent distrust of religion. He said the practice of religious freedom is a true litmus test of the degree of civilization of a society. Scola was speaking at a conference celebrating the 1700th anniversary of the Edict of Milan, when the Emperor Constantine gave religious freedom to Christians. And a week of controversy and clarifications at the Vatican this week, surrounding its handling of an investigation of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, America's largest organization of female superiors. The Vatican on Tuesday issued a statement downplaying remarks made by the head of the Congregation for Consecrated Life. Cardinal Juan Braz Diaviz said on Sunday that he was not consulted about the 2012 decision to impose reforms upon the LCWR. He said the announcement of reforms by the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith caused him much pain. The current head of the Congregation, Archbishop Gerhard Mueller, and Cardinal Braz de Avis met on Monday. The Vatican said the two reaffirmed their common commitment to the renewal of religious life and particularly to the doctrinal assessment of the LCWR. The statement further said that media interpretation of the Cardinal's remarks suggesting a divergence between the two congregations was unjustified. 
Any confusion about the reform of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious was likely put to rest on Wednesday when Pope Francis received an international group of 800 female superiors. In an apparent allusion to the Vatican investigation of the LCWR, which the Pope recently reaffirmed, he told the leaders of women religious that their vocations can only be recognized within the fold of the church. Francis said, it's absurd to think of living with Jesus outside the church. Speaking more generally, the Pope encouraged the sisters to be spiritual mothers, not old maids or spinsters. That's a quote. The General Assembly of the International Union of Superiors Religious have been meeting in Rome this week. And the second time, for the second time in two weeks, a U.S. state has legalized same-sex marriage. On Tuesday, Delaware's Democratic Governor Jack Markell signed a gay marriage bill into law just minutes after its passage by the state Senate. The new law replaces the state's same-sex civil union law. Current civil unions will be converted into marriages though there will be no additional benefits or privileges. Delaware is the 11th state to legalize same-sex marriage. And the historic legislative push for legal abortion in Ireland is officially underway. This past week, the country's coalition government introduced a measure that would loosen constitutional protections for the unborn from the moment of conception. The so-called Protection of Life During Pregnancy Bill would legalize abortion at any time during a pregnancy so long as doctors deem that either the mother's life or health are in danger. Even a threat of suicide would suffice. Under the law, Catholic hospitals would be compelled to provide abortions with no conscience protections for health care workers. The bishops of Ireland were quick to oppose the measure, calling it a dramatic, and morally unacceptable change to Irish law that would make the direct and intentional killing of unborn children lawful, end quote. They further noted that the legislation is unnecessary since existing law allows doctors to take any steps that are medically necessary, even at risk of the unborn child, to save the life of a mother in a crisis pregnancy. Prime Minister Enda Kenny introduced the legislation despite a 2011 campaign promise that his party would do no such thing. Meanwhile, Ireland's abortion debate is making waves across the Atlantic. Protests not unlike those that greeted Notre Dame's honoring of President Barack Obama in 2009 are emerging at Boston College. Pro-life advocates are protesting the Catholic College's commencement invitation to Prime Minister Kenny. Kenny is on tap to deliver the Jesuit College's May 20th commencement address, where he will also receive an honorary law degree. In spite of the calls to rescind the invitation, Boston College has affirmed that Enda Kenny's commencement address and honor will stand. And Hannah Warren, a two-year-old girl born without a windpipe, now has a new one, grown from her own stem cells. She's the youngest patient in the world to benefit from the experimental adult stem cell treatment. Born in 2010 in South Korea, Hannah's been unable to breathe, eat, drink, or swallow on her own. Doctors there told her parents there was no hope and they expected her to die. However, last month, Hannah's new lab-grown windpipe was implanted in a Peoria, Illinois hospital, Hannah's stem cells were taken from her bone marrow, seeded into a plastic scaffold where it took less than a week for them to multiply and create a new windpipe. Early signs indicate the windpipe is working. Hannah's still on a ventilator, but her doctors believe she'll eventually be able to leave the care of the hospital for the first time in her life and live at home with her family. And finally, adult stem cell treatment isn't the only scientific breakthrough in the news this week. It's not quite the fountain of youth, but there is new hope for those who don't want to go gray. European researchers have apparently discovered a treatment for graying hair and the root cause of it, literally. The bleaching effects of hydrogen peroxide is what causes the graying of hair. But researchers have now developed a simple topical treatment that blocks the naturally occurring hydrogen peroxide from attacking the follicle. No grays. The question is, who would use this treatment?
Oh, come on. Some people should just go au naturel. Just doesn't look right. Let me know if you would use it. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'll be looking for your comments. When we return, child advocate Liz Yor will give us her thoughts on the Cleveland kidnappings, the Kermit Gosnell trial, and how the two stories may be related. How do we protect our kids from these predators? She'll tell us. And Laura Ingram is straight ahead when the world over live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. If you are a parent, you definitely can't miss this segment. My first guest has worked for everyone from Oprah Winfrey to the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. Tonight, she joins us to discuss the Cleveland kidnappings as well as the trial of abortionist Kermit Gosnell. Are these stories related? And do they tell us something about our society and the culture and its regard for children? Joining us from Chicago is attorney and child advocate Liz Yor. Liz, thanks for being with us. Oh, I'm delighted, Raymond. Good to be with you. I want to start with why the authorities in Cleveland, Ohio, were unable for 10 years to realize that this guy, this uh, Ariel Castro, had these three women and a child that chained in his basement, locked in separate rooms. There were reports, apparently, from neighbors, suspicious over the years, who reported shadows they saw, people in the backyard on leashes. Why? Did law enforcement fall down here, Liz? Uh, that, that's the ultimate question, isn't it, Raymond? We know in 2004 that the police and DCFS uh, came to the house responding to a call from a neighbor of a woman screaming. There was no answer at the door, so they left. And that's very troubling because they should have followed up. And it's those windows of opportunities that law enforcement and bureaucrats have to make a difference in a life, to save the lives. We know that there were three girls there, teen girls, who had been abducted in 2004. Mm -hmm. And that would have been an opportunity to pull them out of a horrendous concentration camp. Yeah. And they, the bureaucrats didn't care. They just looked at it as one of those many cases of domestic mm -hmm. violence. And you can have all, all the training in the world, but if people don't have a commitment to respond to the call of law enforcement and to the call of neighbors who care, um, we might as well not have a law enforcement system. Hmm. Additionally, there have been reports from many neighbors that there were repeated calls to law enforcement about that particular house. Mm -hmm. uh, law enforcement is denying those charges, but there were opportunities to save those girls, yeah. and to you need to follow up and be aggressive. As, as I watch this and, and read the reportage on it, Liz, uh, you hear the accounts of Ariel Castro, the captor in this case, the abductor, his wife, now deceased, she was often pushed down staircases uh, when she was pregnant. He apparently punched her as well as he did to this Michelle Knight, one of his abductees. Uh, she, this woman, the, Mrs. Castro, was in the hospital repeatedly. There was a record there. I, I just don't know why, when these abductions took place, why Ariel Castro's house wasn't one of the first ones visited. Well, not only that, Raymond, but he was a school bus driver. Right. They allowed him to drive children with an extensive domestic battery record. That's mm. shocking to me. Yeah. And um, they should have, when they got the call about a woman screaming, checked his name, checked his record, immediately know that they had a heads up that they needed to pursue this and pursue it aggressively. Mm -hmm. But they lost a golden opportunity. Liz, I want to jump to the Kermit Gosnell trial unfolding in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, grisly, horrible crimes uh, alleged there in that case. And the pictures and the testimony have been so jarring. Uh, staffers saying they, they jammed scissors in the back of these born children's necks. Uh, the doctor himself uh, did it, was also alleged to have done the same thing. Nineteen years went by, no health official visited that abortion clinic. Is this another case of authorities falling down on the job? It's identical to the Cleveland case. Mm. Bureaucratic apathy, 
Uh, they got calls, complaints about the clinic from women who were hospitalized, from doctors who were complaining about the clinic because they had mm -hmm. seen the victims of his abortion mill, complaints from people who went to the clinic. And yet for 19 years, bureaucrats failed to do their job. It's absolutely incredible negligence on the part of the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. But Raymond, this is this is a moment when we all can learn, whether you're a postman, a meter reader, um, a health inspector, a law enforcement person, a police officer, a DCFS worker, you never know when you have that opportunity to transform a life, to save a life, mm -hmm. and to be so apathetic about you know a, a clinic that has the lives of women in their hands and to just walk away for 19 years and ironically ironically it wasn't the health condition conditions at the clinic it was reports that they he was selling drugs yeah. and so DEA and the FBI went in to investigate not the health inspectors it's amazing tie these two cases for us together for us if you will the Kermit Gosnell trial as well as these abductions in Cleveland what do they tell us about America right now, about our culture, and our regard and, and respect for innocent human life. Well, I think it's very interesting. I'm old enough to remember the debate in Roe versus Wade when we were never able to show the pictures 40 years ago mm -hmm. of aborted babies. That was, you know, they sanitized it, there was a complete media shutdown. The Gosnell case has pulled back the curtain about what goes on. And these babies now, we now see their faces. And we now have, even though they're baby A, B, C, D, E through G in the grand jury report, they mm. do have a name. Yeah. And they, like the children in the Cleveland case, are the missing children. And I'm really hopeful, Raymond, that now that you know, the curtain has come down. Mm -hmm. We now know through live action, through this grand jury report and the Gosnell trial, what really goes on in an abortion mill. Mm -hmm. And you know, Americans are very energized by missing children. You know, the posters of the yeah. missing children, the face, the marches, the rallies. And, re and they do, the public does find these missing children. And I am hopeful that what has happened in the Gosnell trial, in addition to live action, that we will look at these children who are victims in an abortion mill, very similar to the, the missing children in the United States who are abducted by sexual predators. Mm -hmm. There is no difference. They need all of our intervention and help. And, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we've really turned a corner. You know, interestingly, in the Gosnell case and the Cleveland case, the Cleveland case, Castro is being charged for beating one of the victims who was pregnant right. and starving her and causing causing her to have multiple um, her, abortions. Uh, pregnancy. Yes, yes. And he's going to be charged with murder. Mm -hmm. And yet Gosnell, who injected uh, scissors and instruments into children, I into these women causing abortions, was never charged with murder. He's only being charged with murder when these failed abortions, are, these babies are born alive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's showing the absurdity of the arguments in the, in the left and the pro-abortion lobby, that it's mm -hmm. irrational to say that this isn't a baby. Mm -hmm. We're charging Ga uh, Gosnell only when the babies two minutes later are mm -hmm. born alive and charging a man who was a sexual predator. Mm -hmm. um, for um, beating a woman in, um, and terminating her pregnancy, yeah. and he's being charged with murder. Nearly, so there, there are I nearly, uh, Liz, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I don't, I don't want to run out of time. There are nearly 4,000 missing children in the United States, unsolved cases. How are these normally solved? You have spent your life trying to reunite families and protect families and children. They're normally solved by the eyes and ears of the public hmm. who call the FBI, their local police department, who look at those precious little faces on the missing children photos and flyers and get involved. They're called by the na they're solved by the neighbor who thinks something suspicious is going on. Mm -hmm. It's the public that solves these cases. 
Equally true, the public is going to solve this crisis of abortion by getting involved. And so I really encourage the public to continue its advocacy on behalf of missing mm -hmm. children because we do have 50 million missing children as a result of abortion. They are mm -hmm. our missing children, our missing generation. Mm -hmm. And I think going forward, um, things are going to be changing. Liz, before we go, what would be your tips to parents, what are the things parents miss that make their children vulnerable to sexual predators like this uh, Ariel Castro character? Well, there are at least 8,000 attempted abductions every year. And in the old days, we, d we told children, don't fight, don't scream. Now we know from studying these attempted abductions, 72% mm -hmm. the, of these guys are cruising in cars. Mm -hmm. Children escape because they scream, they yell, they have a buddy, they make a big uproar, and they run away. Those are the cases where the kids are not grabbed by these sexual predators. Mm -hmm. That's Children have to be told to fight off, um, run, and always be with a buddy when they're traveling on the streets. Mm -hmm. And uh, Liz, when you, when you hear these cases, and we've talked about this over the years, and see these cases, this guy wrote this letter they found in his house where he said, mm -hmm. I am a sexual predator, um, and it, you know, I, I, it was my childhood that caused it. Are we seeing an uptick in sexual predation and individuals like this Castro man. Oh, we're seeing a huge increase in child pornography. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of trading child pornography, um, they need victims. And you know, his mm -hmm. an his typical answer of a sexual predator, the victim is right. to blame. Right. She seduced she me. Got she got into it the was car. Her Yes, it, mm -hmm. that is so typical of these guys, and that's why they never can be healed, and that's why they never can be trusted with children. It's this disordered thinking of blaming the children. Hmm. You wrote about, uh, just to speaking, speaking about disordered thinking, uh, there is this new app out. We saw the court ruling last week, uh, the morning after pill, Plan B, being made available to 15-year-olds over the counter. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us about this app. There's an app in New York. It was just released today. There was an article that the New York City officials have created an app for um, students in New, New York City to help them to quickly access Plan B and testing for STDs. First of all, the link between STDs, which is a huge epidemic in our culture and in our society among our teens and young people, is because of access to Plan B and free contraceptives. Secondly, secondly, the schools in New York City have plummeting, plummeting rates of education and reading, and their math scores are plummeting. You would think that they would create an app that would help them find tutors, that would help them increase their scores, but no, instead, they're constantly concentrating on the sexual lives as opposed to the educational lives mm. of the children of New York City. It's remarkable. Uh, finally, we see these families, Liz, and we've been watching members interviewed throughout the last few days in Cleveland. Uh, this story had a happy ending despite the grisly horrors that we're learning. How do these families maintain that hope? And what would you tell, and I know you dealt with many of these families who had abducted children mm -hmm. and missing children, what do you tell them and how do they maintain the hope in the darkness, in the quiet times? Well, you know, the DeJesus family, Gina, who was recovered, I don't think it's a surprise that her last name is DeJesus. Mm -hmm. um, they have great faith. Um, these families are the ones who stay after law enforcement to keep this case alive. Mm -hmm. um, they have vigils on the anniversary of the abduction. They work these cases. They're really the true heroes. Yeah. You know, we saw yesterday a new John w Walsh coming to the forefront. Yep. Felix de Jesus knows what it's like to fight to fr find your children and to get law enforcement to investigate and do their job. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be interesting to see as they step up in this new role of being advocates mm -hmm. for missing children. Because if the parents don't do it, nobody's going to look for these kids. Yeah, we're going to have John Walsh on soon. Elizabeth Yor, you can read Liz's columns uh, at your children. Liz Yor, thanks for being with us. 
Thank you, Raymond. When we return, we'll discuss the crisis facing thousands of children in foreign orphanages and tell you why adoptive parents are being shut down due to politics. What can you do about it? Radio talk show host and author Laura Ingram will be here when the world of her live continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. She's the most listened to woman in talk radio and the author of several New York Times bestsellers, including The Cultural Romp of the I Zing, to discuss the increasingly difficult process of international adoption and some hot items from the week. Would you welcome my pal, Laura Ingram? Laura? Welcome back. Hello. It's so fancy in here. Well, this is when I happens. used the studio. It was a closet, but they opened it up for Arroyo. You I love see, it. They, and, and gave a nice new desk. Yeah, I think the, I, the fact that you guys have sushi in the green room is great. You see Thank that? you. And EWTN. no more flashlights. No, producers. Right. Just Very nice. kidding. And they didn't get water on the set. Now, let's Nothing. Do, you don't need water. No. Yeah, let's talk for a moment about you are, and many people don't realize this, the adoptive mother of three children, two from Russia one from Guatemala. I want to start there. Why did you decide to adopt children and why from abroad? Why not I, I domestically? Felt, I, it's, um, it was quite an odyssey. If you would have asked me 20 years ago, would you be in this situation? You're a single woman. You have three children, two from Russia, one from Guatemala. I mean, no, that's not me. That's not my life. And I was called to it, Raymond. After I went through this, uh, cancer treatment and I was uh, going through some difficult health issues, I got past that. Everything's cool and good on that front. I, I just felt, you know something, I have so, I'm so blessed, and I love children, and there are all these kids who were abandoned, and they're stuck, they can't get out of their situation, both here in the United States and abroad, let me try, see what I can, uh, what I can do here. And uh, it was a long process, I actually tried to adopt um, here in the United States, it's very difficult to adopt here in the United States, especially as a single person. So that was a big saga, and huge red tape, and then I went uh, the international route, which I also found out was uh, very difficult. Fraught with difficulty. Tell yeah. us about your experience there, both in Guatemala and Russia, and I use this as a predicate because now both those countries have clamped down yeah, on American adoptions. Yeah, basically shut down. There's no adoptions coming out of them. Um, I, in Guatemala, Raymond, um, I, I decided to go because there's a lot of kids who were abandoned mm -hmm. uh, and decided, look, uh, let's see what we can do. This group down in Texas does great work with abandoned children. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ultimately f uh, found this little girl who was in a, an orphanage. And uh, to all full disclosure, Raymond is uh, one of the godfathers. She's multiple, two godfathers. Yep. You're one of them. And, uh, and so Maria came into our life after it took about two years and a couple of stop starts, failed attempts mm -hmm. to adopt. And uh, it was just wonderful. And it was so incredible. I thought, wait a second. I mean, I'm young enough and I have enough means. Let's see what else I can do. And I lived in Russia when it was Soviet as a student, speak Russian, also speak uh, Spanish. And I uh, went down the process in Russia and uh, did the same thing. Ultimately got two children two different times uh, from Russia. Little so, boys, two little boys well, from Russia. One five, one three years old. But now, in Guatemala, Raymond, they shut the adoption down. So some politics, some concern well, about corruption with there. Well, human trafficking and things. Yes, so they, they tightened the process up. But the, the net result was good families who have the means are uh, who, not not allowed yeah, to adopt children, these children. Children whose names are already changed to American names, Raymond, 100 plus. 175. Five processed. years later, they still find their children stuck in Guatemala. So that's just appalling. It, it's, it's abysmal. It's appalling. There's abandoned kids, both here and abroad, and these willing, loving families would like to take them home. I want to share the Russian numbers. According to Russian statistics, 130,000 children are available. They're in orphanages. In 2011, about 10,816 were adopted. Only 916 of those went to the U.S. The number will obviously decrease this year, Laura. Tell us why. There's a good reason for this. Um, there was a kind of a tit-for-tat politically uh, going on. The U.S. Congress passed this law at the end of last year called the Magnitsky Act, and it ultimately said, look, we're going to bar any Russian coming into this country, not allow them to come into this country, if they were involved in a human rights abuse mm -hmm. uh, compelled by this case of Sergei Mag Magnitsky, who was in jail for corrupting, uh, excuse me, exposing the corruption of Russian officials. Right. So they, they wanted to say, look, we stand for the people who for are human rights. Yeah, for human rights. So this is what Congress did. Well, the Russians, they have, they have a lot of pride. They didn't like that. And so the Russians, they came out in the Duma, this, the legislature, and they said, you know something? We think 
you don't take care of our children when you adopt them. We don't like what you did with Magnitsky. We are going to stop all adoptions from, to the United States now, basically. They let a few go forward, but even some that were in process, Raymond, uh, I'd say almost 100 kids who are still in process, they're stuck there now. A thousand, up to a thousand yeah. families were in process yes. when this ban kicked in, Laura. Yeah, some of them and, have been allowed to go forward, but uh, many others have not. And the Russian justification is that, look, a number of kids came here, we trusted you with yeah. our Russian children, and they died here. Nineteen, 19 cases. Nineteen out of 60,000 Russian adoptees. Now, you look at the, the facts on this, Raymond. I mean, Russian life is not easy. Life, you're, you're very wealthy, it's a good life. But a lot of people, they're very difficult lives there. That's why there are so many abandoned children. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands of, of parentless uh, ch uh, children who don't have anyone to care for them. So they're in these institutions and, and orphanages. Mm -hmm. So have there been some problems? Yeah, but they are minor, and many of them are you know, horrible uh, accidents that have happened. Uh, a few were not. But compare that to the way they would live in Russia? I mean, and look, I, I have great fondness for Russia. I mean, I, I'm, I'm half Polish, but yeah, I still, somehow I, I, I feel an affinity in many ways for, for uh, my Russian friends, and I have many of them. Now, and, and the Russian people, by the way, many of them are very against this ban, and 100,000 plus marched against the ban uh, just a few months ago in Moscow. It was a stunning protest inside of Russia. Now, the State Department has also limited foreign adoptions from Cambodia, yeah. Guatemala, Vietnam. So what are you asking now? What are you? I know you you partnered with people from across the right. political aisle right. to do what? Well, we want to break this these bans. We want uh, sensible regulations to be in place where loving families who are other who are qualified will be allowed to adopt these children. These children are abandoned, and and I'm, I'm, I say people say, well, Laura, there are kids abandoned here. You're, you're right, and there are. And the red tape here is too much for people. And there should be background checks and criminal checks, all of it. Obviously, I'm, I'm in favor of all that. But when, we, when politics gets in the way of a brother or a sister or, or, or an only child finding a forever family, when you're in these orphanages, Raymond, and you, you, you yeah. saw uh, one of the places, your heart breaks. I mean, it, this is not about politics. These are about children with no other hope. So uh, we've, we're, we're par partnering across party lines to raise awareness, to get these politicians to get involved. And, and I've got to say, Hillary Clinton did try to uh, do quite a bit at the State Department, mm -hmm. as yet not successful, and obviously she's gone now. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to stop until uh, I convince uh, President Putin to uh, see it in his heart, to do the right thing for the kids. You can you fight with America about what you need to fight with about, but these are, this is about the children. Mm -hmm. And there's a march coming up, which we'll yes. tell people about at the end of the right. segment. I want to shift gears from the 10 million children, and that's the number, 10 million children languishing in Abandoned. these orphanages all over Stuck. the world. Let's talk about the Benghazi hearing, hearings. Gregory Hicks was the under ambassador, junior ambassador to uh, Stevens in, in Libya. Yes. He got that last phone call from Ambassador Stevens that, that fateful night. I want to play you a clip of the hearing this week yes. and get your reaction. Sure. When Ambassador Stevens talked to you perhaps minutes before he died, as a dying declaration, what precisely did he say to you? He said, Greg, we're under attack. Would a highly decorated career diplomat have told you or Washington had there been a demonstration outside his facility that day? Yes, sir, he would have. Did he mention one word about a protest or a demonstration? No, sir, he did not. So fast forward, Mr. Hicks, to the Sunday talk shows and Ambassador Susan Rice. She blamed this attack on a video. In fact, she did it five different times times. What was your reaction to that? I was stunned. My jaw dropped. And I was embarrassed. Laura, isn't this much ado about nothing? What is going to come from these hearings? Well, I hope uh, ultimately answers. I'm not uh, wildly optimistic that we'll get some. But think about this, Raymond. Think about y you agree to serve your country overseas. Mm -hmm. You go to one of the more dangerous places in the world. The one thing you'd expect, that when you make a phone call to the lead embassy in the country, when you're off-site somewhere, as he was in Benghazi, yeah. we're under attack. And when Gregory Hicks calls the U.S. State Department, talks to his contact there, he expects help is going to be on the way. Military help, which he requested help. twice, and Two it was times. denied. And it, he was told 
to stand down. They were told to stand down. They were not going to be bringing the vehicles. They were not going to be bringing the support. And there's some com well, we couldn't have gotten there in time. Well, remember, back uh, at that point, we didn't know if there was going to be a subsequent uh, mm -hmm. attack or series of attacks on the installation there. We didn't really know what was going on, but we knew the ambassador. We're under attack. Now, how is it that we fabricate the story of a protest that never took place and that no one in the compound said took place? Why was that done? Why? Yeah. That question has not been answered, and that is appalling. I just ran into uh, Chris um, Sean Smith's mother, Pat. Sean Smith mm -hmm. was one of the four right. who died uh, there. And she, she said, look, my son was actually a, a, a big liberal. He was really liberal and Democrat. But he'd, he'd want me to get answers to this. He deserves answers about what happened that night and not Stonewall. It was promises. We'll get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And meanwhile, they, they really don't want to release these emails that were the internal emails at the State Department. Mm -hmm. It was a political campaign season. And it looks like, you know, this common sense reaction, Raymond, the Obama administration didn't want it to look like it was a terrorist attack during a political campaign on 9-11. Dan Hicks testified that they were upset, the State Department was, that he dared to speak out or wanted to speak out demoted. during these hearings. Effectively demoted. Mm -hmm. these, these whistleblowers who came forward this week uh, have testified to being demoted and basically being told uh, they're not pleased with the commentary, the public commentary mm -hmm. about this. Uh, that's appalling. Two quick cultural yeah. stories I sure. just want to touch on oh, for fun. a moment. I love cultural stories. Ab they're so serious. Abercrombie and Fitch it was recently revealed. Oh, my favorite. That your favorite, favorite store. store. I know. Oh. I know you like the posters of the half no, no, no. It's kids. All that horrible. Pushing I mean, they're, sexuality. They're, I mean, the sexuality on, on the little preteens. They, they, they've been doing this for, yeah, years. for years. But it was revealed this trade. week the only size, the biggest size they carry for women is size 10. Of course, they have extra and extra, extra large for the men. athletes, for the men. Is this discriminatory? Well, it, it certainly uh, might be the thing that finally ticks people off enough about uh, A and F brand. As if the advertising yeah. wasn't enough. Yeah. So, but look, people are different shapes. I'm not, I don't get all bent out of shape about this obsession with you know, well, people have to be thin, 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 thin. Mm -hmm. Size 10. I think I was size 10 in college. I lost a little the weight after that. The average size for but, a woman is 12 to yeah, 14. So, but but Raymond, the, the key thing here, and this is what goes into the narcissism of our culture mm -hmm. today. I believe the company president or spokesman said. CEO. Well, yeah, CEO said, well, we, you know, we like people to look a certain way. and Good-looking people. Good We're looking targeting good-looking We hire and we market Who to good-looking people. Who died and made him people. Brad Pitt? Is he some supermodel? i got to take the... Have we you have the, seen him? No. Oh, no, so, we may put a picture of him. Okay, so good. But, you know, I'm not going, I'm not going to be going to that store anytime. I want to pivot to a moment to uh, Tim Tebow, the oh, yeah. celebrated quarterback. Can't find a home in the NFL. No. Some are saying this is a result of Tebow mania. And because he was too outspoken about his Christianity, is, might that be playing a well, role? I don't. I don't know. I'm not a football expert. I mean, some people said he wasn't a good enough player. I, I've always liked Te well, Tebow. He helped the Broncos go yeah, all the way to playoffs. He did help the Broncos. He didn't have much of a chance this year. He wasn't no. given much of a chance. And you know, Sanchez uh, himself kind of flamed out. So mm -hmm. you know, he's going to be around. So uh, who knows? But uh, Te Te Tebow's, I think, presence in the culture is going to transcend this. The, you know, whether he makes it in football or not. Who knows whether he'll be picked up. He is the most influential sportsman, Isn't according to Forbes magazine. Yeah. And, so, I, I, and, he, and yet he doesn't have an NFL home? The great, the great thing about it was that he uh, tweeted out, after he was let go by the Jets, he tweeted out a Bible passage. Basically, mm. you know, through Christ is, you know, is the way. That's the way. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have my plan. Your, your, your plan is, is, mm -hmm. is the most important, which... I like that. It was cool. You yeah. know, I, I'm not a football expert, so I don't, I don't know if he's good enough or not. Believe me. I, no, we'll I just like watching the game. We'll see what the next move is for Tim Yes, exactly. Laura good to see Andrew, you. Thank Sports, you. orphans, we cover Benghazi. It all. And I mean, size 10 pants. Where else what, are you going to get this in television? No You're not going to get anywhere. Come to the march next Friday. Are you going to tell them? I'm going to tell them right now. Here is the info on the Step Forward for Orphans March. It begins Friday, May 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern. The march begins at the Washington Monument, and it finishes at the Upper Senate Park. You can learn more at lauraingram.com. Now, you're going to be speaking yes. with I'm Senator speak. Mary Landrieu. Yes, a lot of special guests. We're going to have a great time. We've got a lot of adoptive families from across the country are going to be there, and just special friends, and I, um, I hope a lot of EWTN uh, viewers. We're going to have a really good time, and it's, it's the right thing to do. These kids are stuck. We need to make them unstuck and give them loving homes. Okay. Before we go, here's an encore of our well-received Unseen Hero segment. It concerns Jeffrey Wright, a high school science teacher from Louisville, Kentucky, and so much more. Take a look. Jeff, thanks for being with us. 
Well, thank you. It's an honor to be on the show. Hey, I want to give people a sense of your classroom prowess and the reaction of your students. Here's a little clip of a film that one of your students actually made, Zach Conkle. Take a look at this, and then we'll be right back. Test question alert. Test question alert. Nope from the big giant head. I don't fall asleep in this class. I just don't. And it's weird because I can remember falling asleep in every other class. I've never had a teacher like him at all. Like calculus every day, just I pass out. Like he's probably one of the teachers, like probably when I'm 75 years old that I'll still remember. RTs, I fall asleep in there all the time. He's the epitome of what I think a teacher should be. How do you know how far this is right You know what? I think uh, oh, that's what I was afraid of. Okay, <laughs> go ahead and uh, go get that tail for me, please. Jeffrey Wright joins us. Now, Jeff, those were some of your students there, and we saw a touch of your unorthodox methods in the classroom. Was this always your style, kind of over the top, and, and uh, a way of engaging your audience, if you will? Well, they've always said that good teachers borrow and great teachers steal. So I guess I've stolen a lot of good things from a lot of great mentors over the years and, and built a repertoire, I guess. Mm. Tell me about this audience. <laughs> Tell me about your students. Well, gosh, they come from such different backgrounds, and, you know, I, I get them for that one hour a day, and I guess if I can just feel like I can inspire them to learn and have a passion for learning, then they're going to make a difference in this world. So that's what I, I try to do that every day and, and make learning a little bit fun, at the same time very challenging. From your perspective as a teacher, has it become more difficult to teach the course study in light of what's happening in the culture and in the lives of these kids? Oh, absolutely. And, and in fact, that's why I, I try my best to individualize the instruction as much as possible, but I, I do that more by getting to know the kids as opposed to actually changing the instruction. Um, like I said, so many kids come from different backgrounds and, and, and different family situations that everybody uh, struggles in a little bit different way, but at the same time they succeed in, in different ways at the same time. Mm -hmm. Tell me what it means to you to be a teacher particularly today? Well, I guess ever since I was little, um, I see teaching more as a vocation than a job. And it's, it's definitely something that I've been called to do. And I just know in my heart and in my mind that when I can touch a kid and, and like I said, make that kid love learning or try to figure out what that kid wants to do with his or her life, and how they're going to make a difference in the world, and I'm, I'm doing what God has called me to do. Mm -hmm. And I know you're a Catholic. Uh, I, w I was stunned watching this piece, which incidentally, this little film, which I, I posted on my Facebook page, um, it, was, uh, it, it showed you at home, and we're going to show a little clip of that. Um, and I was struck by, the, when, when it started, I said, this guy's got to be a Catholic. You could see, you know, the sort of sacramental uh, expression coming out, and your your concern for each one of these kids. This wasn't a um, a rote recitation. This wasn't just a, a cold class study. It was really uh, embedded in all of that. Certainly, you're teaching them, but embedded in that is are really these life lessons. And I want to I want to mine that a bit and 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 let you explain that to the audience. Here's a little clip of I think one of the keys to your success. And I know you've woven your son Adam into your course study. Here's a little clip of the yes. film with you and Adam. Yeah. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Oh. Bless us, O Lord, that these like gifts which you're about to receive from the bounty of oh. Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like Abby is perfect in every way. She's uh, actually 15, not 14. She's 15 going on 25. She's, you know, one of these people that can't stand her dad because he's stupid and a little bit nuts and, and so forth. So I, I, love, I love her to death. When Adam came along, though, we didn't think it was going to be a boy. And all of a sudden, right. a boy pops out, and I'm thinking, wow, this is cool. Now I got a girl and a boy, and not that I really cared, but you get all the dreams of, wow, I'm going to be going to football games, I'm going to be going to baseball games. If they're not any good at sports like I am, we'll be going to you know, plays or something like that, whatever it be. Yeah, I'm going to be there for my little buddy, OK? No, now we have to give her our address. Oh. So what is our address in Spanish? Mm. Uno, uno, doso, doso. 
Now, now Jeffrey, uh, tell me about Adam. I mean, there was a little introduction uh, of him there, but uh, he has Jobert's syndrome. Tell us about this syndrome he's contending with. Jobert's syndrome is an autosomal recessive disorder, so my wife has to have a gene, I have to have a gene, and uh, what it affects is the uh, vermis of the cerebellum. It, it's sort of the part of the brain that connects intelligence with all the physical ability. Mm. So I basically have a perfectly intelligent kid, but he can't tell his body what to do. Um, he gets very, very frustrated, um, he tends to be extremely self-injurious, um, he'll, he'll just hit his head or if he gets... If he gets upset, he'll start kicking his uh, legs on the side of his wheelchair until he bloodies himself, or he'll mm. roll out of bed and start banging his head on the floor. So it can be, you know, a, a big challenge as far as um, the disabilities. And, and there were several things when he was little that was hard, too. And initially, you, you, you all weren't sure if he could communicate. Tell us about the day that you realized he could. Oh, that, that was absolutely incredible, because Adam was born blind. And um, I, I state this in the film. Um, it was Abby that sort of gave us that great awakening and, and taught us how to treat him normally. I, I went up to Abby's room one day and all of a sudden she had her little brother playing dolls. <laughs> and I said, Abby, what are you doing? And she says, I'm playing with my little brother. And I said, but you know, he can't see, he can't do anything. And, and anyway, he started kicking the dolls and I said, wait a minute, if he can kick those dolls and, and do that, he can see. And so it's like, by her working with him and playing with him and loving him, she sort of taught him how to do those sort of things. So mm. it, it was Abby that really was the great awakening for us. Mm. And tell me, I mean, obviously, this must have been a trial for you personally. I'm sure a challenge to your faith uh, when oh. you discovered that the idyllic little boy that you had envisioned was not what God intended for you and that indeed he had a greater ideal in some ways for you and your family. Absolutely. And, and I guess, you know, when St. Peter said everything uh, in life is based on faith, hope, and love, I have to say that I started doubting every one of those when, mm -hmm. when he was born. But it was, it was everybody around us that really showed us the hands of God. And the fact that, for instance, um, a 15-year-old girl came up to me at church and said, hey, I know that you could teach Sunday school, can I take care of Adam because I want to be a special ed teacher when I grow up. And I'm thinking, well, heck, if, if she has the faith to do it, how come I can't do that? Mm -hmm. And another lady at church came up to me and said, you know, I, I work with a lot of people that do therapies. Can I arrange people to help you out with therapy? And, and so it was all these people that came out of the woodwork that we never asked. And it's like, somebody's on our side. And we had no clue why it was all these good things were happening to us, you know, to get through this challenge. But we always were told that we could do it. So all these other people gave us hope and gave us faith and, and a heck of a lot of love at the same time. Hmm. And you eventually, you and your wife, you, you taught Adam how to sign, right? Uh, how to use sign language to communicate. Uh, yes, sir. And that, that was done through a uh, videotape set called Signing Time. It was all done to music. And hmm. Adam loves music. And so we were able to learn it rather quickly, too. And w when we were able to... I don't know, it was just absolutely emotional to me when I saw for the first time when he signed, Daddy, I Love You. That was just remarkable. Oh, beautiful. And he, he's so special, amazing. And you have now taken him and his story and really woven it into your course study. How do you, how do you introduce Adam's story and your story, really, into the study of physics? Why bring it into the classroom in that way? I think, for instance, today, I was teaching about entropy, and that's the, what that is is the whole idea that all the energy in the universe is going to become unusable. Hmm. And the kids really don't care about that. But if I put it in a different light and say, okay, if everything's going to be just totally wasted, what's the point of life? And we talk about how big this universe is and how small we are. And to make it personal to them, I introduce them to my son, Adam. And the fact that, you know, he has so many disabilities, what's the point of it all? Mm -hmm. And I think when they can realize that here he is, he can't, he can't talk, he can't walk, he can't do a lot of things, but he can love. Mm -hmm. And it's love that sort of makes all those other things worthwhile and gives purpose to this life. And mm -hmm. I think when they learn that, even though it's in a public school, that's not religion, that's just part of life, that they realize, well, maybe this 
maybe this does have meaning, and maybe this physics does mean something important to me. Mm -hmm. No, it, and it's obvious they're, they're touched and moved deeply. I mean, they came out of the classroom, you know, weeping and, and <laughs> hugging you after one of your, your lectures. Uh, is that a common reaction? And what do you think about this story, your family's story, so deeply touches them? Well, it's a common reaction because I know a lot of what goes on in, in my students' lives. I, I, some of these kids have um, you know, been abused and they come to me and they talk about it. Some of them have gotten pregnant and they come to me and they say, oh, can, what, what can I do about that? Mm. And so when I know a lot of personal things and then all of a sudden they realize, well, you know, other people are gonna help me get through my problems too, I think they realize that you know, if they have love in their life, they can get through it. Yeah. No, it, it's such a witness. It's so powerful, and uh, and the and the the, the film. I'll, I'll tell everybody how they can see it. I've, I've mounted it on the Facebook page, but it's something. It's 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 an incredible. It really does beautifully capture uh, not only your teaching approach, but your your whole story, your family, and one feels the love and the faith that is present in the family and that you then export into the classroom. And here's the question. So many people live divided lives. They believe one thing and they do something else. How did you come to blend and, and live a consistent life? Well, that's why I wanted to go back to you because you're pointing it out to like I'm the hero here and I, that's not the case. Hey, Jeffrey, I get to determine who the heroes are, okay, <laughs> on this show. So that's, that you're a hero <laughs> in my book, okay? Well, it's, it's the fact that so many people are constantly coming out of the woodwork for no reason at all. I mean, they see Adam and they, they just want to love him unconditionally and he gives it back somehow or another. And I learned from that. And it's, it's everybody else helping us out that allows that blend to happen and for me to have the faith and hope to, to keep going. So, like I said, I don't know what Adam, how he has the ability to get that to come out in people, but even as I was walking in the parking lot tonight, uh, this man Charlie, he walked up to my son first and said hi to him before he ever said hi to me. I just think that's so neat yeah. that people have, didn't do that. That's, that's special. Uh, Jeffrey Wright, whom we're speaking to, Jeffrey, what would you say to people? Uh, and I often hear this, particularly in Washington, D.C., as health care policy is drafted, et cetera. And they say, you know, these people with special needs, they don't enjoy the quality of life that the rest of us enjoy. And therefore, uh, you know, these lives are just not... We've got to be very careful about the way in which we care for them or even encourage people when they know early on that they're to have a child with special needs. You would say what to them? What I've learned through all this is the fact that, uh, yes, all my dreams for Adam had to change. But what was cool is those weren't my dreams. Those were, those were the good Lord's dreams. And yes, Adam might not enjoy life like I would enjoy life. But I think that's a selfish way to look at it because we should live our lives for others. And that's what I see my son and my daughter and all of my family doing is the fact that Adam can pull love out of other people. And what a purpose in life to have. So mm -hmm. I, I wish I was better at that than, or as good as that as he is. Yeah, you're pretty darn good at it. What do you, what do you want from your students, Jeffrey Wright? What do you want them and to inspire them to do after going through your class and sharing your heart with them, really, which is what you really do in addition to your considerable knowledge? I, I think that every one of us have in our mind what we want to be, in my case, if I grow up, but <laughs> not only in our mind, but in our heart. And I think we got to put those two things together. And so that's why I teach physics the way I do. I, I think a lot of these kids have brilliant minds and they think they want to become engineers and doctors, but I also want them to look inside their heart. And if you can put those two things together, like I said before, you don't end up having a career, you end up having a vocation. And that's, that's much more fulfilling in life than just making money. I agree. And the goodness that comes from that is obvious in the students that uh, were interviewed in the, in the film. And, uh, and, and obvious talking to you. So uh, we so thank you for coming out tonight and, uh, and thank you for what you do every day. 
Like I said, it's an honor. Thank you so much. All right. And you can see the award-winning short film Rights Law by Zach Conkle, a former student, by visiting my Facebook and Twitter account. I posted them there. And I encourage you not only to check it out, but to share it with your friends. <laughs> All right, so what's we're doing through, man? All right, ready? You gotta have me carry it. That's what I thought. Okay, ready? Uh, uh, what are you grunting for? I'm going to have to pick up the load. Uh, uh, uh. He pulled the dirty old rag from his pocket and threw it up in the air, and the raven would swoop down and grab the rag in his beak. Good boy, Forrest smiled. Now I give it back. No, Chuck, Forrest Grown, you're supposed to return it to me. But he could not get the Raven's attention. And total frustration. What a man. Well, that is all the time we have. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Go to RaymondArroyo.com. The Twitter and Facebook pages are linked on the left-hand side of the site. You can also sign up for my weekly e-blasts there as well. And look, send me an email and let me know if you have an unseen hero in your community, in your family. We'd love to shine the light on them. Tune in next week for another installment of the Unseen Hero segment and much more. In the meantime... We'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.